say good morning and uh, welcome to Conowingo Baptist Church. It's so good to, uh, to look around and to see you all here today to worship with us. And, uh, and as you look around, you can see we are full blown ready for BBS. And, uh, and they have done just a fantastic job. And I wanted to uh, to just uh, to, to quickly just give a, a round of applause for all those who are helping out with BBS. set up, the teachers, the volunteers, all those who have come in at night, come in the day before and everything else, and, uh, and for Susan, our BBS director, um, thank you so much for all the you Now, if you are a visitor here today, you look in the pew in front of you, there's a booklet there. And, uh, and you can just fill out that little welcome packet there, and we'll get you some information as a visitor. And you can fill out there and let us know if you want a phone call, if you want some contact, and I'll be sure to contact you this week. And I apologize if you filled one out the last couple weeks, uh, you'll be contacted this week. Um, the Deacon of the Week is going to be uh, Brother Richard Henderson. And so Richard Henderson, our Deacon of the Week. And so what that means is that if you have a need at the home or you have a neighbor who's got a need, something like that, just call the church. We'll coordinate with the Deacon of the Week to ensure that we can help you out. Um, I want to extend, uh, continue to extend our uh, condolences to the Shires family as we uh, had a funeral for Brother Bud. Brother Bud was the chairman of Deacons here. He was a member here, and, and the family is, is one of the founding families of this church. And so they had their funeral here yesterday with all the decor up. And, uh, and they were they said Bud would have loved it that way. He loved children. And so it was a celebration to the Lord. And I'm thankful for his witness uh, of his family. And also um, I want to uh, extend the uh, condolences also uh, through the McMillan family, but through uh, for the Mustard's uh, family and, and for the loss of, uh, it was Tom? For Tom. And, uh, and we extend that, that condolence there to the family and, uh, and pray for them. Um, we are, are a nation right now that needs specific prayer. And with the loss of the police officers this past week, um, we need to remember not just the officers and their families in Dallas, and not just the ones we have here in our congregation, but this morning, we're going to start, uh, before I, I continue any of the other announcements we have this morning, um, I want us to, uh, to stand and have a prayer specifically for all the police officers uh, in this great nation of ours who are going in the line of duty. And we as a church, I believe, need to stand up for them. And we need to, uh, to show our support as we don't just say, oh, I support the police. We are going to lift all our officers up to our God and King who is in charge and authority over all the armies of all the universe. And so let's have a prayer right now for our police officers as we go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, our brave men and women are under a spiritual attack in our nation. And Father God, through the discernment of your spirit, we know that this is an attack on authority. It is an attack on unity. So Father God, we ask right now that you and your angels would be sent out to every district, every precinct, to everyone who puts on a badge, to serve and protect. That you, Father, would surround them with your love and your protection. And Father God, I pray that they would feel and sense that presence around them and understand that you are sending it in love and in peace. That as they understand and begin to understand that they're being surrounded by your love and protection, that they would realize, first and foremost, their need for you as Lord and Savior. But second, their need to be a witness in the community of Jesus Christ. So Father, we pray for forgiveness for those who have hurt our officers. 
We pray that you would speak to them and convict them of their sin, that they may turn to you and experience the transformation that we have in the love of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you would support those families that are in grieving today. Let them know that you have not forgotten them, you have not forsaken them, but that you love them and you'll be there through everything else. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, as you can see, today we are starting BBS tonight. BBS will be from 6 to 8 30. And if you have not yet registered for a BBS or registered your children, your families, all that, there's registration cards in the foyer uh, downstairs. And we're asking if you are a leader or volunteer for BBS. Please be here at 5.30 if you can. 5.30, we're going to have a specific time of prayer, dedication, and then some other instructions that we want to give you. This week, there's going to be no regular Wednesday night services because uh, we're going to be doing VBS in the evening. And just let it be known that next week, we're going to have a student VBS, so a specific VBS for the students. Um, and then the 90th anniversary is just a couple weeks away. And your bulletin, I hope you got your bulletin this morning, your bulletin will have the schedule for the 90th anniversary. I think you'd be really excited and surprised about some of the members who are coming back to preach and to share. And so this morning, what I would like to ask is, let's see here. I always just look around and pick something up. Junie, no, we missed you. We missed you so much, we want you to pray. Open up the service, please, sir. Go ahead. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here today. And we thank you, Lord, all of you. Your Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. Lord, I pray today that we talk about these officers, Lord, and the Lord, that you would just bless them. Be with us, Lord, as we see them and thank them for what they do. Lord, I ask you to be here with us today as the music sung, as Josh preaches the word, and Lord, the Holy Spirit would guide us, Lord, to you. And we here in Halloween are we can make a difference in this area. Father, I pray that we would witness, Lord, to our neighbors, to our family, Lord, to let them know, Lord Jesus, that things are, that you still are a loving God, that you are a just God. And Lord, we just praise you for that. We ask you again to be here with us today. Be with that one that needs you that's closest to eternity, Lord, who doesn't know that they're lost. Lord, I pray that you pierce our heart today. We love you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, pray. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be in your church house today. We thank you for this beautiful day and the sunshine, Lord, and the many events happening in our church this month and starting today with Vacation Bible School. We just pray your blessing upon each teacher and each little child as they come to Vacation Bible School. Bible school, Lord. We just pray your blessing on everything that will be said and everything that will be done. We pray your blessing upon these offerings, Lord, that will be used to glorify your name. And for the cares and concerns that we have in our hearts for our church and our country, we just pray for the families that are affected by these shootings, Lord. We just pray that you will comfort and heal where it is needed. Lord, we just pray for all the policemen in this country, Lord, that you will watch over and protect them. Lord, we love you and we thank you for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
this cup up here on Josh's little altar. CPC, this is something that they're selling at the 90th, five bucks. It's got CBC on it, Conway kind of Baptist Church. You could purchase one if you see Lissa, Diane. Sparky's got some in the back. Oh, Sparky's got some in the back. So they're five bucks. Nice little low lift from there. Let's all stand. Please and sing. Show me the presence of the Lord in this place. And we're all in our hearts. Never failing and mercy. 
No other God. No other person. No other thing can make that claim. He rose and conquered the grave. No other. Today's message is continuing the series we're doing called Red Letters. We're looking at everything that Jesus said in His ministry here on earth. The subtitle today is, We Never Saw Anything Like This. My prayer for everyone in here today is that your soul will experience this truth if it is not already. As you turn to Mark chapter 2, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 12 this morning. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, You rose from the grave. And You show us in Your Word the heart that You have toward mankind. Father, let us see something that we have never seen we pray for a blessing on this message today that you would speak directly to us and to our soul in Jesus' name. Amen. The first section that we're going to look at is we're going to see the man lowered. See the man lowered. We start here in verse 1, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 31, it also parallels this traveling that Jesus did back to Capernaum. And so what we find is Jesus returned home, and it says it was reported. He came home, and it was reported. I believe that when the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ dwells in a place, we better believe that news will spread. I praise God for His loving mercy. I praise God for His very real presence right here at Conowingo Baptist Church as He has ministered for 90 years. Now why is the presence of Jesus reported? Well, Jesus heals things, yes? But he was also teaching with authority. People weren't used to seeing that. People weren't used to seeing the power of God spoken out the way that Jesus could do it. And see, our souls rumble within us for the truth of the Word of God. 
Just as we hunger for lunch. Now I'm talking about lunch and it's early. <laughs> Just as we hunger for lunch, we need to recognize and realize that our soul is hungry for the truth of the Word of God. And the truth of God is found only in Jesus Christ. So verse 2, it says, Many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And He was preaching the Word to them. Let's get into this setting that's being described by Mark. Jesus had just got done traveling back to what would become His base camp there of ministry in the region of Galilee. And when He returns to this temporary home, it says, Many were gathered together. And as more and more people flock to Jesus, it says there was no more room, not even at the door. I think when you and I imagine a home that's very crowded, I don't think we picture people falling out the door. What would that look like? <laughs> But you know, Jesus, he goes into this home, the report's there, and people just start running up. They get so squished up in that room that they can't even get in the door. Let us never forget, because it says that he was there and he was preaching to them. Jesus used his time to preach truth into the lives around him. And why I say that is we need to never forget that as we come to approach God with all sorts of expectations and all sorts of requests and, and petitions for our prayers, we need to remember that when we approach God, we need to always have ears ready to listen. So what do we make of this concept, the Word? He said He was preaching the Word. You know, both the Old Testament and New Testament agree. Look at this, 2 Samuel 24, 11 to 12. The Old Testament and New Testament agree about this concept of the Word of God. When David arose in the morning, look at this, the Word of the Lord, or Yahweh, came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, and look at this, saying, the Word came and the Word spoke. Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you, that I may do it to you. This is the Word of the Lord. You may be saying, The Word sounds a whole lot like a person, does he not? Luke chapter 3, verse 2. That was Old Testament. Let's look at the New Testament. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And after the word of God comes to Zechariah, Zechariah goes out and he starts preaching, and John starts preaching the word. The word of God is not just a book that you hold in your hand. He is a living being who speaks. Revelation 19.13 sums it up best as possible. He is clothed. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which He is called is the Word of God. See, we can often get confused that the Word of God has something to do with the translation. We can get more confused and say the Word of God has something to do with Greek or Hebrew. My friends, the Word of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word, and by His Spirit, men were inspired to write down what He said. These are the collections of writings with which we call Scripture. And these two, Jesus plus Scripture, are intrinsically tied together, but we must recognize the truth. Jesus was preaching His own personal Word by His own personal Spirit. Verse 3, they came bringing to Him a paralytic carried by four men. Have you ever seen anything like this? Four men come in, they're bringing a paralytic on a bed. See, I asked this question this morning for one main reason. Even though you and I may not think we have seen this exact same narrative, we say, I've never seen a paralytic. Never seen him on a bed. 
Never seen him carried by four men. Think about this. You ever witnessed a family praying for their lost one? You ever heard the prayer of a parent lifting up their son or their daughter? Their family member to the living God saying, God, heal them. See, we as the saints are intended to bring souls before the throne of our King. Be encouraged, therefore, that our Savior is still the healer of the nations. You may think you've not seen this story. But in the spirit, if you kind of look around and reflect on your memory of what you've seen God do in families where there's lost ones, I think you see the story just fine. Now back to these men. What are they doing? They bring to him a paralytic. They carried a man who was unable to carry himself, which means these four men agreed on a plan to change the circumstances of their friend. Consider, therefore, some of the plans of Conowingo Baptist Church. Do they reflect this spirit here? Do the plans that we come up with reflect the heart and attitude of saying, I recognize people in need, we will do whatever it takes to get the gospel, to get Jesus Christ into their life? You know, as I was praying about this, the elevator came straight to my mind. This is a plan. We've come together. For those that are in need of transportation in a way that they cannot do themselves, we say, we're going to build an elevator. Do not forget, that is a plan God has laid on our heart as a church. And we will see the work of God's hand in that elevator, I have no doubt. But we must always be willing to carry out the items that Jesus puts in front of us in order to benefit the welfare of those in need, both physically and spiritually. Verse 4 says, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Have you ever avoided something because of a setback? Like, have you ever intended to go somewhere, maybe to eat, and when you got there, there's a line? And that line's so long, you can't even get in the door, and you say, why don't we just go somewhere else? So we look at the reaction of these four men here and we say, man, something more must have been going on, right? These four men came to a home so crowded, people are falling out the door. And they're like, well, there's a roof. I, mean, I honestly don't even know what that brain even thinks like. Like, that's not my brain. There's a roof. Get up through there. We'll carry this man up a roof and get him in there. See, these men were not going to stop until they got this man near to Jesus Christ. They removed the roof above Jesus. You know, I wonder, has there been a crowd? Has there been a roof that you have allowed to get between a lost person and Jesus Christ? Is there something you look at and say, well, that's just going to be hard. That this is just this is just not going to be easy, so I'm going to walk away. Has there been a series of difficulties that have caused you to turn away from missions, to turn away from outreach, to turn away from discipleship, instead of simply finding a way and digging in a little deeper? See, these men tore through a roof in order to get their friend to Jesus. And when they had made an opening, it says they let the bed down. A house full of people just trying to get healed, just trying to hear Jesus teach, and all of a sudden, pieces of the roof start falling down. They look up, and those pieces become a hole in the roof. And the hole in the roof gets filled with a bed in the roof. And the bed in the roof is now coming down. And at some point they realize there's a man on this bed. What do you think everyone's looking at? 
I don't care what they came for. What do you think they're looking at then? The man. What do you think everyone's waiting to see? What's Jesus going to do next, right? We need to believe that when we have a heart for the lost and a heart for the needy, so much so that we go out of these walls and go way out of our comfort zone to introduce them to the love of Jesus Christ, you better believe everyone will stop and watch. What is Jesus going to do next? Everyone wants to see the power of God. Everyone. Concluding point number one, we see the man lowered and we see he was supported by compassion. These four men said we're not just going to bring in and say, oh, we, we want a good thing for our friend. They said we're going to do something about it. This church is full of the love of Jesus Christ so much so, let's start having it leave these walls and introducing the community to the love of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Section number two, see the truth questioned. See the truth questioned. Verse five, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. You know, one extremely powerful thing about this verse is that Jesus doesn't actually turn and specifically direct and speak of the faith of the paralytic. <clears throat> he says, their faith. This is plural. The faith of the four men at minimum. How does Jesus ever see anyone's faith when the Bible defines faith in Hebrews chapter 11? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If it is a conviction of things that are not seen, and yet Jesus saw their faith, how? Because real faith is a conviction. Real faith will lead to proof of that faith. Proof is the result of truth. The result of a true faith is going to be actions done in real time. One way to think of it is this. Our faith is not our big secret to keep from the world. Matthew 5, 16, we read this a few weeks ago in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may what? See your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. See, another very powerful element of this verse is actually how Jesus responds to individual faith. It says, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. He saw faith, and then he forgave sin. You know that when we come to Jesus with our needs, whatever our needs are, did you know Jesus responds with even more? When we come to Jesus with whatever needs we think we have, Jesus responds with more. As you heard a few weeks ago, Dr. Carter preached on more grace. I pray you've felt that in your life. I pray you've experienced that in your life. I pray that you've experienced more forgiveness where you didn't deserve it. But that is exactly who our God is. He saw the faith and He responds with more. You know, in this story, what's incredible, the men that lower Him down, they don't, we don't see any record. They say, Jesus, heal Him. We don't see any record when the paralytic is brought down. When the paralytic looks up, Jesus, heal me. They don't say a word, but Jesus saw their faith. So what did he do? He forgave sins. Have you ever had your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ? If you've had your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Do you understand that it was because of the same grace we see right here in this story? The same grace where Jesus sees a paralytic come out of nowhere and he looks and he sees faith. The same grace that says, I don't have to and they don't deserve it, but I just want to forgive. Same grace extended to every one of us that just said, praise the Lord. Make no mistake about it today. 
When we look at this story, we may want to identify with all sorts of people. We may say, oh, Jesus is somewhere. I'm going to be there. I'm going to crowd the house. We may see this story and say, oh, Jesus is somewhere. I'm going to bring the lost up to him. I'm going to bring we may see that, but we need to recognize first and foremost we're the paralytic. Before we're anything, we are the paralytic. We are the one who has no ability within ourselves to be good enough, to deserve it, to find our way into the kingdom of heaven. We are the paralytic. And we are lowered down by the grace of God. And we're drawn into the presence of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit that we may hear the gospel and be saved by faith. Verse 6, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Just as people were following Jesus because they wanted to learn, you better believe there are people following Jesus just to wait for him to mess up. And my friend, if you call yourself a Christian, that word means little Christ. You are a little Christ walking everywhere you go. And you better believe people may not ever tell you they are waiting for you to mess up. They're waiting to see something in your character that is different from what they've heard about Jesus so they can accuse you. And I'm not saying that to make you feel all pressured, but i got to live perfect now, whatever. What I'm telling you is the Holy Spirit inside you has empowered you to live in a way that glorifies God. And God wants you to not walk around questioning in your heart, can you? He wants you to walk around going, oh yeah, I'm saved. I'm forgiven. This is why this heart right here that we see in the scribes, these weren't dummies. These weren't, these weren't people that, that weren't intellectually capable. These were the smart guys. We need to be real careful when we come into the house of God, when we come into the presence of Jesus Christ, we need to be real careful and examine our hearts and say, why am I here? Are we here to be in the presence of Almighty because He is enough, or... Are we here in order to prove how much we know or how great we are? When we hear the words of Jesus, do we see Jesus' grace in the life of another, or do we respond in some other way in our heart? Do you see somebody lost? Do you see somebody you say, man, that person will never end. Then you see them saved and transformed. When you look at them, what do you do in your heart? Do you praise God for the work that He's done? Or do you say, ah, we'll see. The scribes here were questioning in their hearts. Questioning what? Verse 7, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? We see at least three examples of very bad theology right here. Theology is your own personal understanding of who God is. True theology is who God is. We see three examples of bad theology. Bad theology number one is believing that Jesus is just a guy. Just some man, like any other, he's just a bad theology. Ask yourself, who do you think Jesus is? Not your neighbor, not the person next to you, not who you hope to one day think he is. Right now, who do you think Jesus is? Good theology is this. Believing that Jesus is God. That's good theology. Bad theology number two that we see here is believing that Jesus' words are blasphemy. Blasphemy is saying what is clean is unclean. The ultimate blasphemy is saying God, who is ultimately clean, and saying to him, you are unclean. That is blasphemy to the worst extent. Bad theology is thinking in any way that Jesus' words are are blasphemy, that they're unclean. Therefore, as you examine the words of Jesus Christ and you apply them in your life, is there anything Jesus has said or taught that you look at and you say, I'm not doing that. It's too hard. It's too difficult. I'm not going to do it. What you have done is you've taken Jesus' words and said, that's unclean. Blasphemy. That's bad theology. So ask yourself, what do you think about what Jesus said? What do you think about the things that Jesus said? Because good theology is believing that Jesus' words are Holy, set apart, special, clean, super clean, oxy clean. <laughs> Bad theology number three 
is believing that Jesus is incapable of forgiving sins. Bad deal. If you believe that Jesus is incapable of forgiving your sins, my friends, you are living in an existence that is lost, separated from God Almighty. Where do you think forgiveness is available outside of Jesus? That's the question you ask yourself. If you don't think it's in Jesus, where do you think that forgiveness is going to come from? Good theology is believing that Jesus is the only one capable of forgiving sins. Here's the point. You and I may know a lot about God, but if we do not know that Jesus is our God, then we are believing bad theology. To the scribes, Jesus really was just another man with an audacious and radical claim. So back to the question just a second ago. Who do you think Jesus is? Remember that faith is proof of the unseen. So you may be sitting in here thinking to yourself, well, if Jesus was sitting here in the church, and if I could walk up to Jesus and touch him, I'd believe. If you think that, my friends, you're not reading the whole story. Because, see, the scribes were sitting in the same house as Jesus. Jesus was literally right there in front of them, and he just said, Son, your sins are forgiven, and yet it says they questioned in their hearts. Faith is not about what you see. It is about what you are hoping in. I believe everybody in here believes in the principle of cause and effect. I don't think there's anybody in here that says, nah, no, nah, if I push the cup, it won't fall. I think everybody in here believes in the principle of cause and effect. Am I right? Raise your hand if you don't. We'll talk about it. <laughs> and yet, you know what? Everyone in here believes in cause and effect. Can anybody walk up here and give me some cause in my hand? Can you give me some effect? You're going to come up here and put it in my hand so I can put effect in my pocket? Go take effect and lock it in the treasure box back here? Hey, kids, you want some cause and effect? Come and get some. Oh, but I can't hold it. I can't touch it. But you hope in it, don't you? I'm sure you're hoping there's going to be lunch later. For that cause, there'll be an effect. Faith has nothing to do with what you see. It has, what to do. it has to do with what you hope in. We all just collectively agree. We all believe in something we cannot hold. But we all know 100%. It is 100% real. Here's the cause and effect you might want to know. If you do not have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and know Him to be your Savior and forgiver of your soul, the effect will be you are going to hell eternally. It's real. It's real. You can't put it in your pocket, but you might want to put it in your brain. It's real. We have experienced the truth of cause and effect because we see it all the time. And for those who are truly saved, you have seen the proof of cause and effect from Jesus Christ. We have to put our faith into His death, burial, and resurrection by believing that we're sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus displays all the power we would ever need. And please do not think for a second that Jesus may be unaware of your disbelief if you're here today and you've not trusted in Him. He knows whether you believe or whether you don't. You can trick the people in the pews. You're not going to trick the God who created you. Verse 8. Immediately Jesus, perceiving his fear that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? He discerned, he perceived, he used wisdom, and he saw their what? Disbelief. Jesus saw and perceived their questions, so he did what? He called them out. Why do you question these things in your heart? My friend, is Jesus calling you out today? As you're sitting here in the pew this morning, is Jesus flat out calling you out in your spirit today? 
is Jesus perceiving in his spirit that you personally are questioning his power or authority in your life? Have you failed to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Well, if you want to know exactly how long it takes Jesus to see and figure that out in you, it says, read the verse, immediately Jesus. It doesn't take him any time whatsoever. You want to dig a little deeper? Jesus knew your disbelief before you did. But even though he knew it, you know what's great about our God? He loves you enough to ask you why. You may be sitting here questioning, maybe saying, I don't know about all this Jesus stuff, but Jesus loves you enough to say, why? Why do you question it? See, so you may have a fear of flying. A lot of people do. A lot of people have a fear of flying. A very real fear is one of the biggest fears people have. Fear of flying, fear of heights. I used to work on this helicopter. It's called a CH-53 Echo helicopter. They call it the Super Stallion. I think it's a boss. <laughs> When the 53 Echo came out, changed from the Delta, they got three engines. Three jet engines. And it holds a lot of Marines. Those guys aren't going there to drop stuff off. They're going there to get in. That thing's going to carry all of them. And they don't carry a Hummer underneath. Now let's say that you're walking along and you fall off a cliff. And you roll all the way down the cliff and you realize you're in a crater. And you can't get out of the crater. I don't know where this thing comes humming along, hovering over you, comes landing in, and they say, hey, you're not going to get out of here without this. And you sit there and you're like, wait a minute. I've never seen one of these. I've never been on one of these. I don't think this thing can pick me up. Just so happens the engineer, the 53 Echo, gets out of the helicopter. He's like, hey, they brought me along. They thought you might be stupid. <laughs> Or <laughs> This helicopter right here that I designed, it will lift 30,000 pounds. It'll lift you up. You say, yeah, but I'm not sure. I'm not so sure that helicopter's going to lift me up. I'm not so sure. See, this is exactly what happens when the God of the universe says in his word that he came here and died for you and that he alone has the power to save your soul. When you look at him, you say, I'm not so sure. He says, why are you questioning me? This helicopter does a loop-de-loop. -loop. It's powerful enough to do a loop. <laughs> My friends, our God is powerful enough, as we sang this morning, to rise from the grave. Amen. See, not only is Jesus strong enough to save you, he's strong enough to save all of humanity, all of history, and all of eternity to come. He designed the law that you and I are guilty of, and he designed salvation that you and I can trust in. There's no need then to be like the scribes and the Pharisees who were trying to trust in their own sense of religion and their own sense of understanding. And yet, here was the God of the heavens standing right in front of them, forgiving sins, but they questioned in their heart. If you're in here today, and you say, I've never put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you heard an echo of praise. Praise the Lord. You're sitting around people who can tell you it's real. Concluding point number two, see the truth question. These scribes were dangling by legalism. What that means is they were trusting in the law. They were trusting in themselves. They were dangling by their legalism. Section number three. See the sins forgiven. See the sins forgiven. Verse nine. Which is easier, Jesus says, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take your bed and walk? In this verse, Jesus is asking a question based on the scribes' own personal evaluation of Jesus. They're looking at Jesus saying, nah, why is he saying that? Jesus turns around and says, i got a question for you. Which is easier? Jesus is actually emphasizing that both statements are impossible to fulfill from a human perspective. Whether you or I as a human being walks up to another human being and says, hey bud, your sins are forgiven. Or if we walk up to a lame paralytic and say, hey, get up and walk, dude. It's impossible from a human perspective. It cannot be done ever. No matter how many books you've read, no matter how many degrees you've got on your wall, 
No matter what your bank account statement is, you cannot walk up to another human being and say, get up and walk, bro. Impossible. This is because our sins and our sorrows are impossible to heal without Jesus Christ. This is why he's asking the question. He says, okay, guys, who are so smart and thinking and questioning me, the God of the universe. Jesus says, okay, let me ask, which one is easier for you to do? Are you going to say get up and you're forgiven, or are you going to say get up and walk? Which one are you going to do? Verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, he said to the paralytic. See, if you're in doubt today, may I stress the words of Jesus here. He says, you may know. Jesus wants every one of us to know his forgiveness. Maybe you're sitting in the pew this morning. You say, you know, if I were to die today, I really don't know where I'm going to go to heaven or hell. But I hope I'm good enough to get into heaven. God says, you can know. And if you don't know, the answer is no. If you don't know, then no, you're not getting into heaven. Jesus says, you may know. The term son of man that he uses here, the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Son of man is used a lot in the Old Testament. It's often used just as it sounds, a person that's been born of another human. Hey, you're a son of man. You are a son of mankind. Jesus is invoking authority, though. He says the Son of Man has authority. So Daniel chapter 7 tells us what authority Jesus is speaking. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. His dominion or authority is everlasting. His glory is over all peoples, nations, and language. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is the Son of Man prophesied in the book of Daniel. He's the one who comes with the clouds of heaven to rule over all the earth. So when he says the Son of Man can forgive sins, he isn't suggesting that there's a bunch of religions you can choose from. And if you want, you can choose him. He's not saying that. He says there's only one. There's only one. The only option that we ought to choose is Jesus if we intend to ever receive the forgiveness of God. So what does Jesus do in order to prove that he is who he says he is? He says, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. I don't want to skip over this command of Jesus because I want to see what's actually occurring. The unseen truth that Jesus displayed was his universal authority over all creation. This wasn't just a man standing up and walking. This was authority over all creation. Hebrews 11 Verse 3 says this, By faith we understand the universe was created by what? The Word of God, Jesus Christ. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. When Jesus says, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. I love this because look at this. He assumes each step is going to happen. Why? Because He's God. He doesn't say, Rise and wait. Okay, let's just see if He's going to get up. He says, rise, and then I know you're going to rise, so then pick up your bed, and I know you're going to pick up your bed because now you can, and I want you to go home because now you can. When God says something, there's no question. When God says something, there's no question it's going to happen. Two seconds ago, you couldn't walk. Two seconds ago, you're going to walk home. Because Jesus is the one who said these words, look at verse 12, and he rose, and he immediately picked up his bed, and he went out before them all, so they were all amazed, glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The paralytic did rise. The paralytic did pick up his bed. The paralytic did go out, and where do you think he went? Oh. Oh. 
So how do we know? Well, Matthew 9, 7 tells us he rose and went home. <laughs> and just so that we don't miss the point this morning, when the paralytic rose, when the paralytic picked up his bed, and when the paralytic went home, Jesus was showing just how easy it is for him to forgive sins. He asked, which one's easier to say? Forgive sins or get up and go? He says, but I want you to know something. He says, I don't want you to doubt. I don't want you to question. I want you to know my power and authority over all creation. And that's exactly how the crowd responded. Now they knew. They were all amazed and glorified God. It's amazing that Jesus can forgive your sins. It's amazing that he does. It brings glory to God, and that is the plan of salvation. And the crowd says, we never saw anything like this. And until Jesus becomes your new reality, you must not fail to understand the truth that you will not find this anywhere else. Until Jesus is your salvation, you're not going to see anything like this. You will never see anything like what the crowd saw that day. However, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you can know that today you can go from being lost, completely incapable of saving yourself, you can go from that to being in the hands and the arms of Jesus Christ. Just like the paralytic, you can rise from the dead. You can respond to the call of Jesus and rise from death and sin to be transformed to walk in newness of life. Concluding point number three, see the sins forgiven, rising by authority. You can rise by the authority of God today. Let's pray together as we have a time of invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us instruction and giving us testimony of what you did. You tell us in your word in another place that if they tried to write down everything you did, the whole world would be full of books. Father God, let us just understand that you are the architect and engineer of life itself. Let us know and believe that if you rose the paralytic, you can certainly forgive sins. And Father, you can forgive our sins no matter how dark or how deep we think we fell. Father, I ask that you would speak to every one of us today. If there is one who needs to be saved and they know that they're lost, I pray they would come forward here in a moment when we stand together. I pray you would move them out of the pew and help them to come forward that they may hear your truth. If there's someone here today who's been saved and they've never been baptized, going fully under the water and fully out to represent your death, burial, and resurrection according to the Scriptures, God, help them come. But lastly, Father, if there is one here today and they believe that they've been brought here by your Spirit to become a member of Conowingo Baptist Church, Father God, I ask that you would let them come forward. By your power and by your discernment, let them come. God, whatever it is that you lay on the hearts of your people today, let us be obedient as we listen and follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. You come forward if God leads you.
Praise the Lord that we get a picture in Scripture of Jesus just simply looking, seeing a person in need, and not just healing their legs, but healing their soul. Let's join hands together as we conclude the service today.